Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the 78th session of our um, Stanford MedAI group exchange sessions. So this week, um, we are very honored to have Vivek Natarajan from Google Health AI here with us to speak about their work on foundation models for medical AI. And uh, Vivek is a staff research scientist at Google Health AI. Um, and he advances bi biomedical AI to help scale world-class healthcare to everyone. He's particularly interested in building large language models and multimodal foundation models um, for biomedical applications. And he's the Google Brain uh, moonshot behind MedPalm, Google's flagship, uh, flagship medical large language model, and a lot of other projects. So very exciting work. And thanks so much for um, joining us today, Vivek. And I guess before we get started, do you have any preferences on when you'd like to take questions? Um, would you prefer them at the end or like more interactively? Um, I'm fine either way. So maybe I'll have scheduled stops at the end of each section and then you can wait for questions. And then, yeah, okay, that. sounds great. Yeah, I guess um, let's try to like make this as interactive as possible. And without further ado, let me hand it over to Vivek. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Nandita and uh, the other organizers. I did not realize that this has been going on for 78 sessions. So uh, great work on that one. But this one is also useful. Um, so, so the first question, I guess, is for all of us, like, why are we all here? And I hope it is due to the shared belief that, you know, AI can transform medicine and healthcare and improve lives of billions of people worldwide. And I guess, um, not to beat the drum repeatedly over here, but it is very clear that the opportunity mm -hmm. is immense. Um, for example, on the right, there is a study uh, in the Lancet suggested that uh, scaling up medical imaging using AI would avert like millions of deaths caused by cancer worldwide. And similarly, we might be able to use AI to help catch and diagnose diseases like TB earlier, which is considered the world's deadliest killer. Um, so the potential for impact over here is especially huge and especially in the developing world. And so perhaps naturally, uh, there's been tremendous interest in applying AI to medicine and health. And this interest has spanned uh, industry research labs such as Google DeepMind but also like, you know, government backed uh, consortiums such as SERI and academic institutions such as Stanford. And people have looked at various kinds of application ranging from medical imaging to, you know, continuous risk prediction from health records to discovery of novel biomarkers using AI. And I guess one of the most brilliant aspects of deep learning and AI and how it has evolved so far is the fact that it has been a fairly accessible technology. So even high school students, for example, in Latin America are able to like, you know, train models sometimes as well as like, you know, deep learning experts. So that is pretty awesome. Um, and given this widespread interest, uh, what we are seeing is an exponential increase in the number of papers at the intersection of AI and healthcare in recent years. So all this is great, um, but the reality is that translation into product and real world clinical impact has been rather slow. And this is true, not just for Google, but also for Apologies. Yeah, I think they muted okay. themselves. Cool. Yeah, sorry about that. Go ahead. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, uh, so what I was saying was that while there's been a lot of progress on the research front, uh, translation into products has been uh, rather slow. Um, and in fact, I see very few medical AI products that are used in hospitals and clinics today. And very few of them have, say, even thousands of users, let alone millions or billions. And what I'll say is while there are many challenges such as regulatory, privacy, policy, and financial incentives, I would argue that probably the key reason for this is most AI systems developed till date are just not ready for uh, real-world clinical applications at scale. 
Um, and I believe what is missing in like the AI that has been developed till date are the following key, th uh, three key things. So the first one is channelization or the ability of the model to maintain stable performance under distribution shifts and rapidly adapt to new environments using minimal supervised data as possible. Um, the second aspect is reliability or the ability of the model to accurately say when it doesn't know about something and backtrack to other humans in the loop. And the third one is more around interactivity and expressivity. So if you look at it, medicine as a practice, it's a humane endeavor with language at the heart of it. And language facilitates all sorts of interactions between people and those who provide care for them. Um, and yet most AI systems developed till date are incapable of having any sort of interaction with the user. And this in turn leads to frustrations and a mismatch of expectations and in turn just prevents more effective and broader uptake of uh, AI and real world clinical workflows. But fortunately for us, while all this progress at the intersection of AI and medicine uh, and health has been happening in the last few years, there's been another uh, parallel trend or rather I would say, uh, the, or rather I would want to use the word revolution and that revolution has been in foundation models for AI. And this has resulted in the emergence of a new paradigm which really offers us an opportunity to like rethink and redesign medical AI from the ground up so that it is more performant, safer, accessible and equitable for deployment at scale in real world clinical settings. So I kind of realized that I'm giving a talk at the birthplace of foundation models. And so I think you all are already very well equipped on this topic. And just to clarify, when I say the birthplace of foundation models, what I mean is foundation models is a marketing term and nothing else. Um, but aside from that, uh, as a very quick summary, the way I like to think about foundation models is that these are just large scale models trained on large data sets with large compute and often using self-supervised learning objectives. And what emerges as a result of doing this is that these models seem to have very impressive few shot learning and generative capabilities. They seem to have the rapid ability to adapt to new tasks and environments using as few label data as possible and sometimes just using instructions. And one other aspect of these foundation models that is I think somewhat underappreciated is that they seem to be also very reliable. Uh, and what we observe is the fact that among other things, such large models and when trained using these large scale training processes, the calibration and out of distribution performance also seems to improve in a large variety of domains and settings. And there's been recent work from Google AI called Plex that goes very in depth on this topic. So given all this progress, the question is how can we leverage the advances in foundation models to make medical AI more performance, safer, accessible and equitable. And so in the remainder of this talk, I will introduce a few recent efforts from my team on which kind of like show us the way on how we might be able to effectively do this and build towards more generalist medical AI uh, foundation models. So the first paper I want to talk about is, uh, found it, uh, is, is foundation models in the medical imaging space. Um, this paper is called Remedis or short for robust and efficient medical imaging with cell supervision. And this paper has been accepted for publication at Nature Biomedical Engineering. Um, and as I alluded to before, one of the key translational challenges and unmet needs in medical AI is this problem of data efficient generalization. And by this, what I mean is that the model should be able to generalize and maintain clinically applicable performance when it is deployed in new unseen clinical environments using as few labeled exemplars as possible. Um, a recurring theme with all of my team's work is in medical AI is that you will see that we stress quite a lot on not just model innovation or methods innovation, but also on rigorous evaluation. And again, so for this notion of data efficient generalization to rigorously evaluate it, we took a three pronged approach. So we measure the standard in distribution performance of our models. But in addition to that, what we also measure is the zero shot out of distribution performance. That is the performance that you get out of the box in a new clinical setting or environment. Um, and so what is expected over here is that there will be some performance drop, but hopefully it is not catastrophic. And then the last one that we measure is few shot out of, out of distribution performance. And what I mean by that is how many data points or exemplars do you need to reach clinically applicable performance in this new setting or environment? 
And further, in order to do this rigorously, uh, we considered multiple imaging modalities in TAS, spanning dermatology, retinal imaging, chest X-ray interpretation, pathology, and mammography. And in each of these ratios, in each of these settings, uh, we have different ratios of unlabeled data, in distribution data, and OOD data. And I'll come back to the importance of unlabeled data in a moment. Um, but more importantly, uh, what we encounter in each of these different tasks and modalities is a complex combination of distribution shifts. Um, so these include technology shifts, such as the use of a new imaging camera equipment, uh, population shifts arising from like moving to a new country, state, or even new hospital, and then behavior shifts where differences in the workflow uh, lead to differences in the ground truth standard or you know, um, just how the labels are collected and processed and so on and so forth. Um, and ideally what you want is your method to perform well across all the three evaluation axes and across all these tasks and modalities so that you can make strong claims on data efficient generalization. Um, so what does a method look like? Um, so yeah, Remedis over here uh, leverages a combination of large scale pre-training on natural images uh, followed by another step of intermediate self-supervised learning on unlabeled medical data. And we use this combination to build up a strong foundation model. And this method works because there are billions of images literally on the internet from which you can learn very strong visual representations and then leverage the often substantial but unlabeled medical data to adapt these general foundation models to the medical domain. This combination is simple, but is very effective. And as we will see in the results section, it greatly reduces the need for task specific label medical data. So how do we learn strong visual representations from billion scale natural images? Um, for this, we leverage what I like to call the OG vision foundation model, a uh, big transfer, which came out of Google research back in 2020. The big transfer or bit in short recipe is very straightforward. What it does, it scales up a standard ResNet model replaces the batch norm with group norm and weight standardization. And then it uses large batch sizes to train very powerful models using supervised learning, but with somewhat noisy labels. And once you have this model, then for any new task in the transfer setting, all you have to do is replace the output layer with something that is specific to your task. And then with even a few labeled examples, you can often reach very strong performance. And this recipe seems to work really, really well. Um, so when the bit model was evaluated across a bunch of standard vision benchmarks, and as well as on vision transfer learning benchmarks known as VTAB, uh, the bit model exceeded the SODA at that point of time. And if you look at the few short learning curves uh, in each of the subplots on the left, uh, you will it, it will probably remind you of the curves that you see in the GPT-3 paper, but for natural language tasks. But yeah, this paper came out a year earlier. And given the strong few shot learning and transfer learning performance, we decided to build on top of this model. Um, the other important part of the recipe over here is intermediate self-supervised learning. And for this over here, we used contrastive self-supervised learning techniques and specifically Simplier. Um, and Simplier works by maximizing the agreement between differently augmented views of the same training example uh, via a contrastive loss in the hidden layer of a DNN. Um, but Remedis is very much compatible with any other contrastive self-supervised learning strategy as well. And a bit later in the talk, I'll show results with uh, Moco V2, Relic, and Balo twins as well. And as far as the evaluation goes, uh, as I mentioned, once you have this strong foundation model, we do both in distribution evaluation and then zero shot and few shot out of distribution evaluation. And this is done through standard fine tuning recipes. So you may ask why contrastive learning for data efficient generalization. So I'll not go into uh, the details over here, but there has been work from Dengumar's group at Stanford showing that the representations learned over here are linearly transferable to related new subpopulations and that the features that are learned over here can effectively disentangle domain and class information. And this in turn enables better adaptation to new domains. Um, so how do the results look like? So before I jump into that, you may wonder uh, what is the baseline? 
And so for this, we considered the bit model pre-trained on JFT, which is a data set of 300 million uh, natural images as the baseline, but without any intermediate self-supervised learning. And this is a strong baseline as shown by the performance on the VTAP transfer learning benchmark. And we also had a paper in 2021, which showed that this approach was very strong for medical imaging too. And so when we compare to that, what we observe is across all the six tasks and modalities that we considered in our paper, uh, there were strong in improvements in in-domain performance. So this is the plot that you see on the left in each panel and the blue lines are remedies and the orange one is the baseline. But what we also observe is in addition to the in distribution performance improvements, there are significant improvements in zero shot and few shot out of distribution performance. So on each plot, on the right in each panel, uh, you'll see that the blue line that is remedies is consistently above the orange line that is baseline, even as you increase the number of samples for retraining a model and adapt it to the new domain. Um, and so what this means is in fact, what we are seeing is we are now able to reach clinically applicable performance in new settings using between three to 100 X less data. And when I say clinically applicable performance, what I mean is something that allows us to confidently deploy the model in the new setting. So it could be performance matching that of a human radiologist, for example, or some other thing, but like, but if you know that you reach that number, you know that you can, your model is good enough for use in that setting. So it varies depending on the modality, but more often than not, it is just a human performance benchmark. And the implications of this concretely are that we can now potentially save tens of thousands of clinical uh, clinician hours in annotating data. And there is a significant reduction in the cost for developing medical imaging models, which are often quite expensive. So we believe that using the remedy strategy, you can greatly accelerate the life cycle of medical imaging AI development. Um, another thing I would like to point out is that the in-distribution performance and the out-of-distribution performance over here are not at odds with each other. Um, in many papers that claim to improve OD generalization, uh, what I see is in distribution performance often drops while training to learn what people like to call domain invariant features. But we don't observe that to be the case over here. The in distribution performance and the out of distribution performance improves together, suggesting that the learned representations are simply just better overall compared to the baseline. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, this method is pretty much uh, compatible with any contrastive self-supervised learning strategy. Uh, we show Remedis plots over here uh, with Simplier, Relic, Moco V2, and Balor twins. And on the whole, while I would say Simplier is slightly better, but all methods improve on top of the baseline that is considered over here, which is the, uh, the big transfer baseline on, uh, on JFT. Um, another popular method for utilizing unlabeled data is self training. Um, it's worth pointing out that this does make very strong assumptions about the downstream task, uh, but contrastive self supervision does not make any such assumptions. But even then, uh, when you compare remedies with a baseline of uh, JFT uh, initialized models with self training on top, uh, across the board, what we observe is the remedy strategy leads to better results, both in distribution and out of distribution. Uh, yeah, we also investigated the representations using PSNI. Uh, the top ones are the remedies rep representations on in distribution data and, uh, and out of distribution data, and uh, the bottom ones are for the baseline. And what we generally observed over here are that the remedies representations are better separated across class boundaries, and this in turn, uh, I think, leads to better performance in downstream tasks and applications. Um, another important aspect that we considered uh, and I think is highly relevant for medical settings is fairness and bias as we do uh, train these large scale models. Um, and while there is a lot more to, uh, to be done over here, uh, what we do find is in a subgroup analysis that the remedies method improves performance across all subgroups and not just for the majority class or something like that. And uh, Finally, uh, while the main results were demonstrated using classification and regression tasks, uh, the remedies representations we believe are also useful for tasks such as localization or object detection. Um, so in this case, you see uh, strong improvements in performance using remedies initialized representations for uh, detecting cancer nodules in a mammogram. Um, so I will end on this note over here for remedies. There are more key results and uh, 
yeah, I will refer you back to the paper in case there is more interest. Uh, it'll be out in Nature Biomedical Engineering very soon. And uh, I'll stop here for any questions. Yeah, this is pretty cool work, Vivek. I wanted to start off with one question, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, like for each, so medical imaging is, is pretty different in each modality, like pathology versus, let's say, chest x-rays. So are you going with a, um, like you, you find, like you basically have this intermediate self-supervised um, contrastive um, training strategy for each modality separately, or is there uh, at some point going to be a one foundation model that can be fine-tuned? Um, for modality-specific ones. Yeah, um, so we start with the same base general purpose foundation model, which is this big transfer model that's been trained on, uh, I would like to say, order of billion images. Um, and then in this work, at least, we decided to branch off and create a separate model for uh, each modality, um, just because it enabled easier experimentation. Um, and so we had essentially six different models for six different modalities over here where each of the models were created by uh, bringing in unlabeled data from that modality. So maybe I'll just quickly go back uh, to this uh, uh, visualization. Um, uh, this one. So you can see that we start off with non-medical data, we replicate it across the board, and then we bring in unlabeled medical data from each domain. Uh, and we use intermediate uh, self-supervised learning to uh, learn the representations over there. And finally, a small amount of task-specific uh, label data is used to create uh, the final foundation model for each uh, domain or modality over here. Uh, but as you kind of alluded to, the end goal is to create one single model and um, stay tuned on that one. Awesome, yeah, okay. Um, I actually had one more question. Um, so maybe I can ask that. Um, so um, when you say out of distribution detection, like do you also consider like various types of out of distribution detection? Like I know you mentioned distribution shifts based on population and um, hardware and, and all of those things. I'm curious if you also considered something like where con like new concepts are basically provided at test sets. Like basically uh, maybe a new pathology that the model has never seen before. Um, can this still be a good few shot um, candidate or is that something that uh, requires more uh, supervised data? Yeah, that's a good point. So when we were doing the study, we were more interested in realistic distribution shifts. Um, and, uh, and that is often not restricted to just one kind, but it's a complex combination of several things. And so we were kind of interested in simulating that using retrospective data. And so almost always in each of the settings as we go from uh, that source to the target domain, there would be a very complex combination of shifts. But then we also isolated to study, for example, the impact of uh, you know, degradation in the quality of the hardware um, or adversarial examples. And again, we found these, uh, or corruptions in the image. And again, we found like the Remedis uh, approach to be substantially better and leads to a less reduction in performance overall. But what you mentioned in terms of new pathologies, new concepts, uh, we haven't studied that, uh, but it is definitely of interest. Well, thank you. I think we have one question from the audience. Akash, can you please go ahead and ask your question? Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, very cool work. One thing that I think is interesting is that we've seen similar, like, I guess, sort of trend or basically you get really good generalization and performance with um, large scale multi pre pretraining. So I think we saw with Clip, you know, you get like pretty good, like zero shot performance on it, like whatever task you want, like ImageNet, whatever. Um, and I guess this, something that's unique about this is that it's restricted to vision only. Do you think that like basically by scaling up and including like non-medical data as like pre-training, um, do you think that that sort of circumvents the need to include a language modality, I guess, to enforce good representations? and or do you think like there is even room to improve by introducing text into the contrastive formulation here whenever text is available in whatever data sets that you have? Yeah, I, th I think uh, you're right. Um, if you have multimodal data, then I, I think the tools uh, and approach that we have over here with contrastive cell supervision can scale up to multimodal data as well. Clip has shown that, but I think we can go uh, and even beyond and like have any number of modalities over there. Um, the challenge almost always is the availability of large-scale multimodal data sets. 
uh, it's easier to get image only data, but getting paired image text data is that much harder. And then getting paired multimodal data with like many, many columns is even more harder. Uh, but if you have that, I think um, you can learn representations that are better anchored uh, and stronger. And often we have seen is um, like the number of images that you need uh, to learn good representations if you have bad data. And so the number of examples can be greatly reduced. So maybe you need like 400K images to bit simpler to learn good representations. But if you have like maybe even just like 20K bad images in text, that can lead to the same level of performance. But the challenge is in getting that kind of data. Um, so yeah, but, uh, and I, I don't see any reason why, for example, you can't pair both of them together, right? And so if you have only image, only data, you just generate your augmentations and learn a representation. If you have image and text, you can again put that into the same model and learn those representations. So I think these are all complementary and can just overall enrich the quality of the representations that you learn. Awesome, thank you. I think we have another question from Christian. Yeah, uh, thanks for your great talk. Um, my my question is a bit related to what Nandita was asking. So currently you're working with different foundation models for all of the modalities, but you mentioned that an extension of your current work would be to um, basically create a big foundation model across several modalities. Now the modalities that you're using are really very another. So I'm um, I'm raising the, the question whether it would make sense also to include non-medical images for the pre-training because probably because they are much more prevalent and you can, for instance, if you work with a data set like Lion or something like that, um, use a diverse set of, of, uh, of natural images, general domain images. Um, and through the sheer scale, you can probably reach pretty good visual res representations um, like my, my, my point is that these modalities that you have included here, for instance, pathology image and the radiology image, although they both are medical, they are visually very um, different from, from each other. So what's, what's the reason to restrict yourself to medical images versus just scaling up and, and training on general domain images if you're goal is to, to create um, good visual representations. Yeah, um, so that is what we precisely do, right? So we start with the representation that's learned through billions of natural images happening, uh, like occurring on the uh, internet. And this was one of the key insights that we had back in 2021, where there were claims that there is too much distribution shift between natural images and medical images. So if you have models that are uh, pre-trained and initialized only using um, natural images, they are not as good as say random initialization and we kind of debunk that myth by saying that you know what the the key factor whether is scale scale of the model and also the scale of the data that you're pre-training and once you do that you can learn really really strong representations that transfer well to the medical domain as well so i see there is no reason not to leverage that and just and they happen to occur you know so broadly and there are so many checkpoints available that i think it's just a very good idea to start with them but then i think this you need to adapt these models to uh, the medical domain as well so i think you can't uh, if you have access to medical data, even if it's unlabeled, that's fine. I think that will just only enrich your model. But if you don't have access to any data, just you just have like an order of a few hundred task examples, task specific uh, medical examples, that's fine. You can take these general domain representations that are scaled on large scale data sets. And I think you will get pretty strong performance right now. And that's what we showed with our medical bit paper back in 2021. And I think the model sense can have become just even more powerful. Now, uh, building on the question from Christian. Uh, so first question, uh, you are definitely using very a wide variety of modalities going from chest x-rays to pathology. Uh, do you use the exact same architecture of the model or do you think, uh, or do you tweak the model architecture for let's say going from chest x-rays to pathology uh, images? Yeah, there are, there's very little task specific customization. So even the augmentations that we use in the contrast yeah, strategy. So architecture is fixed. The only thing is we learn uh, the weights for each modality separately, but everything else is fixed. Uh, so that's why we say it's a very simple strategy. Um, there's nothing fancy, no task specific customizations. Um, and even going from natural images to medical images, do you use almost the same kind of reprocessing or um, you're tweaking your pre-processing augmentation, anything? 
yeah the augmentations that you do in the contrastive strategy they are kind of like custom and specific uh, you don't do that okay. for images but it's yeah it's same across the board for all modalities, modalities. okay thanks and any uh, observation from working with such wide variety of modalities i mean what kind of modalities can easier to generalize to for example are is, is it easier to uh, build a foundation model for chest x-rays versus uh, a pathology yeah. image or they are just equally difficult yeah i think it comes down to two things i was actually just wanting the availability of the data so if you look at chest x-ray and pathology uh, the data sets are much bigger in scale compared to some of the other modalities that we were considering uh, for example dermatology there aren't that big uh, open source data sets just because of the privacy of the uh, uh -huh. um, so yeah but once you have big data sets i think it's more like it will end up with very good representations but obviously the more diverse the data is the better it is and again, I think it's good on uh do you think the the bar of how much data is enough changes from going from modality to modality right um in your observation because you work with such wide variety of modalities you think a smaller data set might be enough for um chest x rays but a larger data set might be needed for uh let's say uh, i don't know maybe dermatology images or pathology images yeah i think it also comes down to the headroom on the task um because some of these stars the aucs or the accuracies are already very high so uh -huh. I don't know if it makes sense to try and get more data because already the models are pretty good. Okay. Um, but uh, one thing I will quickly mention is the ratio of unlabeled data to labeled data is also important as you're doing self-supervised learning. Mm -hmm. So if you want to see tangible benefits, uh, I think a ratio of around five to one is important okay. uh, at least because that is when that the number is big enough for you to learn. To learn something. Thank you. Okay, um, so if there are more questions, I'll move on to uh, the next part. Um, the next paper that I want to maybe briefly talk about over here is called CODOC, uh, short for Complementarity Driven Deferral to Clinicians. Um, so what we have seen in our prior work at Google uh, Health AI is that our models often outperform human experts in certain constrained environments and settings. Uh, and the vice versa is also true in that human experts also outperform our models in certain other settings. So to that end, uh, we developed CODOC. Uh, what CODOC does is it learns to decide when to rely on a diagnostic model and when to defer to a clinician. And what we show is that the system obtains improved accuracy relative to a baseline of clinicians alone or AI alone. And uh, we demonstrate this in multiple clinical settings, including uh, mammography, uh, lung cancer screening, and TV screen. Um, and the way to think about CODOC is that it is a routing system that wraps around predictive models. And so it learns patterns in the data where the AI model uh, consistently overperforms or underperforms clinicians and is trained to maximize the combined AI human performance. And by doing this, it learns to defer uh, in a clinical workflow if it recognizes a pattern where the clinician is uh, supposed to outperform the model. And so the way the CODOC training and deployment is done is we obtain the confidence score, uh, specifically the softmax score that's outputted by a deep learning model. Uh, and then this is fed into a deferral model, uh, which decides to either use that confidence score uh, of the model and apply a threshold to it to come up with the final decision for disease or no disease prediction or defer to a clinician, in which case the medical image is diagnosed using a standard clinical workflow involving one or more clinicians. And we refer to this composite decision-making apparatus uh, comprising the deferral AI and the selectively invoked uh, diagnostic AI model or the non-AI clinical workflow as the CODOC system. Um, the diagnostic AI models are pre-trained uh, similar to Remedis or other large-scale pre-training strategies and then fine-tuned on task-specific custom data. Um, and what is uh, worth pointing out over here is that uh, pre-training data set uh, need not be accessible at all for this uh, whenever this deferral AI model is trained. Um, and so to create the training data for the deferral AI model, uh, a fresh set of medical data, uh, uh, this is referred to as tuning data, uh, is passed through the diagnostic AI models 
Uh, and then clinician opinions and ground truth labels are also collected for this tuning data set. And a tuple of AI scores, uh, clinician opinions, and ground truth labels are obtained for uh, each medical data in the tuning data set. And then these tuples are used to train the deferral AI model to decide when to defer. And if not deferring, to choose an operating point for the diagnostic AI model to make a final uh, diagnostic prediction. And this is done to maximize the accuracy in terms of sensor spec for the composite deferral AI system. Um, and so using the AI and clinician accuracy uh, summarized in the relative accuracy graph uh, shown in this slide, uh, the deferral AI system learns deferral regions, uh, which are depicted in gray. Um, so when the average softmax score from the diagnostic model lies in one of these gray regions, uh, the CODOC system defers to clinical workflow and presents the outcome of the clinical workflow as the final diagnosis. And when the average softmax score lies in the green region, uh, CODOC presents that either the disease is absent, and when the softmax score lies in the red region, CODOC presents that the disease is present. Um, so that was the training and deployment uh, strategy. Uh, and the way we validated CODOC, as mentioned before, was in uh, the mammography setting primarily. And what we saw is that on, um, yeah. Um, and so, what, so in, in this plot, what we look at is uh, breast cancer prediction. And so the standalone AI model performance is shown in the purple line. And the red diamond is the gold standard of a team of expert uh, human radiologists. And by using the CODOC workflow and pairing up AI with clinicians, the CODOC plot uh, line shown in blue is statistically superior to a uh, gold standard, which according to a recent survey was never previously exceeded using AI systems. And I think the best part is with this system, uh, and when we simulate this, what we are seeing is a 66% reduction in the number of human reads required overall in this setting. Um, and then we also validated CODOC further. Um, and so on the left, uh, what we show is that the system manages to maintain these gains, even in a previously unseen population for the diagnostic model. And uh, even without retraining, CODOC is able to obtain a significant improvement. And then on the right, what we show is that CODOC generalizes to a completely new task and modality. So over here, performance is shown on a popular lung cancer detection task. And we show that even with a modestly performing human team member, uh, the CODOC system is able to extract complementarity uh, with a significant lift from using the AI on the base thing. Um, so this is a very quick sneak preview of CODOC. Uh, there'll be more results in our upcoming Google DeepMind paper, um, but I will uh, stop here for questions before moving on to the final part of my talk. Maybe one question. Uh, I can take that question if other yeah, people. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and do. It. Yeah. So one question is: um, Is can I? Am I right in thinking about Kodak uh, as a tunable calibration layer that you're putting on top of your model to kind of get the correct range uh, uh, threshold so that you're maximizing your AI's um, confidence and, and accuracy? Like, is that the right way to think about it, or is this? Else. Yeah, I think that is like, uh, one way of thinking about this. It's essentially trying to identify or like trying to predict using the outputs of the model itself, and also knowing how clinicians perform. Uh, when should we rely on the clinicians? So it's using a combination of the model's outputs, uh, as well as what we know about human team members and their performance, and then using all that data together to come up with a deferral system. Got it. And how big or how complex is the is the decision making model like is that a very simple um, it's a simple like, model uh, it's not complex got it and i guess we'll learn more about this in the paper but um, yeah. are you thinking of um, like uh, are softmax scores really the only things or can you also use like intermediate representations to kind of get a better idea of um, oh is the model actually learning well or not yeah um, so we did the simple and the obvious thing first, but as you can imagine, we can do more complex things, you know, feed in features from uh, different parts of the model and also make it more interactive and iterative uh, where we can maybe uh, make this system output questions or concepts that it needs to ask a human in the loop so that you can get more information and then it can iterate and you know, together have a more collaborative and composite workflow. Um, so we're all, we're working on that, but in this paper, we talk about the simple and the obvious. Got it, thank you so much.
Awesome. Um, so in the last part of this talk, uh, I want to talk about our work in the space of large language models or uh, foundation models uh, in the language domain and specifically MedFarm. And also I want to maybe uh, sketch out how Remedis and Kodok and MedFarm are kind of like building blocks towards a fully interactive and reliable medical assistant and generalist medical data. Um, so I believe my teammate Karan has already presented MedFarm in detail over here. So I'll kind of try to be brief. Uh, the motivation for this work is actually very straightforward. Um, as I mentioned before, medicine is a humane endeavor and language is at the heart of it. And we really need interactive and expressive medical AI that can understand and communicate using language for more broader uptake of AI in the clinical uh, world. And as I also said, like recent progress in um, transformers-based LLMs uh, really allows us an opportunity to rethink medical AI with language mediating all this human AI interaction and collaboration. Um, and I'll be honest if I don't point out that there's been plenty of work in large language models for biomedicine, especially in the last few years. Um, but what's really missing is benchmarks. Um, there's been no real big bench kind of uh, thing for uh, large language models in the medical domain. And also what is an, another thing that is missing is an evaluation framework where we go beyond objective metrics, which can often hide um, important details and go towards more rigorous human evaluation so that you can be more confident about your model as you deploy them in the real world clinical settings. Um, and then as I mentioned before, our papers are almost always a combination of methods innovation paired with strong and rigorous evaluation. And the MedPalm paper was no different. Um, the key or the other key question that we wanted to answer with MedPalm was we knew that these large language models are trained on internet scale text and the internet uh, data sets almost always contain at least a pretty big fraction of medical domain information. So we knew that some medical knowledge was definitely encoded in these models. The question was, uh, can the model then like, you know, reliably recall it and then reason about it to do well in a task such as uh, medical question answering. So yeah, MedPalm under the hood is basically just three things. Uh, it's a diverse benchmark for uh, medical question answering. It's a uh, the paper proposes a very comprehensive human evaluation framework. And finally, it, it shows how a state of the art general purpose LLM combined with a data efficient alignment technique can do really well in the safety critical medical domain. And so in order to assess the potential uh, of LLMs in medicine, we decided to focus on the medical question answering task. And the reason for doing this is uh, medical question answering has always been a longstanding grand challenge for AI, similar to go and protein folding. Um, I know that there are research proposals from esteemed scientists at MIT dating back to the 1980s, uh, you know, putting together funding requests to the NIH, uh, asking to build medical AI systems, uh, in those days using expert systems uh, and graphical models. Um, for use in clinical decision support settings. Um, and again, this is a very broad topic, but one particular instantiation that has emerged really popular in recent years has been answering US medical license exam questions. Uh, and, but then even despite all the progress in transformers and large language models, um, until December, 2022, uh, the state of the art models were plateauing at around 50% uh, performance on a popular USMLE representative questions benchmark known as MedQA. Um, and then the other thing to point out over here is answering medical questions requires a combination of comprehension skills, recall of medical knowledge and reasoning. And almost any task in a clinical setting can be framed as a medical question answering task with an instruction. So it's a very general purpose API as well. And uh, so we had the task narrowed down and the next question was what was the benchmark and uh, and when we were looking through the literature we saw many different medical question answering uh, data sets and so we decided to pull them all together uh, and this in turn allowed it to probe different abilities including the ability of a model to answer professional medicine questions such as a medical license exam versus research questions on PubMed QA or consumer medical questions and it also allowed us to, uh, to probe the model ability to you know, answer MCQ questions versus long form uh, answer questions as well. And then the ability to do open domain versus closed domain medical question answering. Uh, another quick thing I wanted to point out was as we were looking at all these data sets, um, what we thought was missing was a more um, solid benchmark on uh, consumer medical question answering. So we decided to put together a benchmark 
called Health Search QA, which consists of commonly asked consumer questions uh, to a search engine such as Google. Um, so here are a few questions. So the first two, Health Search QA and Life QA, are consumer medical question answering uh, setups. And you can see that the questions are fairly short and what a user would ask a search engine. Um, and on the right, you see an example of uh, US medical license exam questions, which consists of a vignette with uh, symptoms, lab results, and other details about a patient. And then you need to reason about all the information that is present in the question as well, as well as recall appropriate other medical knowledge to come up with the right answer over here. Um, and then the next thing that we uh, looked into in detail in the paper is how to evaluate the model responses. And it is very important that we go beyond objective metrics such as uh, MCQ accuracy or blue or cider or whatever, because they can hide important flaws in the model. And I'll come back to this in a, uh, a bit later. And so in order to do this, we decided to build upon actually some work from uh, a bunch of folks at Stanford itself uh, called Chad. Uh, and we elaborated on that a bit more. Uh, and then we had 14 axes or 12 axes uh, for clinicians and a couple of a couple others I'll talk about in a second, uh, which looked into aspects such as uh, the factuality of the answer, the scientific precision of the answer, uh, the evidence of, you know, proper medical comprehension skills, uh, ability to recall medical knowledge, uh, do good medical reasoning, and also the potential for harm and bias in these answers. And so this was done by a panel of expert clinicians. Uh, but then we also realized that the end users of these models are probably going to be lay users or non-expert clinicians who may not have uh, the ability to judge the, the accuracy or the factuality of these answers from a clinical um, setting. And so, it, but for them, probably what's more important is how directly the model uh, answers the intent or addresses their intent of their question and how helpful they perceive the model to be. And so we asked non-expert lay users to evaluate the answers on those grounds. And uh, as I mentioned before, the, the data, we sourced multiple different data sets and uh, we had data from different geographies so that uh, we could do a very rigorous evaluation over here. Um, so that was the the task and the benchmark and the evaluation framework. And as far as the model goes, we decided to build on top of the palm family of uh, language models from Google. Um, I won't go into too many details over here, but palm is still yet the largest densely activated decoder on LLM with uh, 540 billion parameters. Um, and uh, it was trained using a very large scale ML orchestration system that uh, enables super efficient training across GPU boards. Um, and for MetPalm specifically, uh, what we did was we took an instruction tuned uh, variant of Palm known as Plan Palm, and then we further prompt tuned it using a set of expert demonstrations that we curated with our with our in-house panel of clinicians. And uh, when you do this instruction prompt tuning, what you end up uh, with is the base Plan Palm model with all its weights, and those are frozen and untouched. But then you have another set of additional soft prompt parameters uh, that allow you to align the model with the requirements of the medical domain. So the way to think about uh, prompt tuning is, uh, the assumption over here is that all the knowledge that you need uh, to answer uh, the questions that we have in our data sets is already encoded in the weights of the model. And so essentially what you want to do is when a new question comes up, uh, you want to direct the model to the right path of its uh, parameter space so that it can come up with the right answer uh, for this given domain or setting. So it's like a giant library is encoded in uh, the, the the parameter space of the models and the medical uh, section is uh, just one set shelf of books and so you want to direct the model to the medical uh, section when it is answering questions from the medical domain and so that's what this form tuning set of parameters basically does um, so that is the met palm model and then when we looked at the performance of met palm in uh, the usmle benchmark uh, MedPalm was the first AI system to obtain a passing score or higher on uh, representative USMLE questions. But I think the better part was it also performed very encouragingly on consumer medical question answers as well. And so when we did human evaluation and compared the output of uh, MedPalm on factuality and agreement with scientific and clinical consensus, uh, scientific and clinical consensus uh, we saw that MetPalm significantly outperformed a general purpose LLM, uh, which in this case was FlanPalm. And bear in mind that FlanPalm actually uh, is, I think, still the state of the art model on many of the big bench uh, tasks. And we saw that there's a significant improvement. And we also saw that the performance gap with respect to clinicians was being closed by doing this uh, alignment using instruction prompt tuning. Um, 
so since karan has given a uh, big talk on this i'm not going to go into too many details but the next part i want to talk about is metpam2 which we very recently announced at an event back in march and this is going from a uh, passing level score on usmle to more expert level medical question answering performance with lms um and uh, yeah under the hood metpam is switching from a uh, palm to palm2 and it is uh, again end to end uh, fine tuned with uh, instructions and we have a better reasoning approach that we like to call student teacher amplification and we have more comprehensive results over here and um, with respect to highlights of metpam2 uh, metpam2 is now the first ai system that obtains an expert level score on usmle with over an 85% performance um, and this is almost an 18% leap over uh, the metpam model itself and it's also the first ai system to obtain passing score on a benchmark data set of indian medical entrance exam questions and when we did the human evaluation what we saw was that the metpam2 paper was comparing very favorably with metpam under uh, human evaluation too and uh, so when we were looking at what's the difference between metpam and metpam2 answers what we found out that the metpam on two answers were more detailed and factually accurate and they were also less prone to omitting uh, important information that is necessary um so here's a qualitative example um and then when we did a quick human eval uh, preference comparison where we asked a panel of clinicians to pick among metpam1 metpam2 and physician answers and we found out that in the majority of the cases the metpam2 answer was preferred that's the green over here um and uh, metpam1 came later and then physicians answers came um at the end and when we asked our lay uh, pe uh, lay people non expert uh, non experts as to uh, which model was considered to be more helpful uh, again metpam2 was preferred over metpam1 and then finally we had a new adversarial dataset that we curated uh, which was trying to see how metpam performs on axes such as Uh, fairness and bias, or any adversarial question that you might be able to pop up in a medical setting. Uh, and again, on this uh, data set, we saw that MedPalm 2 was much much better and safer compared to MedPalm 1. Um, Could you give an example of of an adversarial question? Um, for example, something like, um, should I, what should I do to commit suicide? Got it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, uh, in, in the last part, uh, like I just want to briefly point out that Metpam actually started up as a bottoms-up Google Brain moonshot, which meant that just a bunch of people across uh, Alphabet came together, decided this was something important and useful to have in the world, and we just built it. And today, where we stand is this seems to be um, a potentially important bond, uh, building block for enabling, uh, you know, general-purpose medical AI systems in the real world and have like you know strong real-world impact. Um, And so, what is our end game with all of this? Um, so, the end game and the north star is a truly interactive uh, medical assistant that hopefully can process multiple modalities of data, do many different kinds of tasks, provide rationales and explanations, and engage in multi-turn conversations with clinicians. Uh, the end game is again a world-class, you know, pocket uh, general practitioner that is embedded in the smartphones of uh, billions of users worldwide, um, that people can turn to. Uh, for all their medical information needs and i think the best part about all of this is uh, we have a very reasonable attack to get there uh, we can take our latest and greatest uh, general purpose foundation models such as palm or bigwit and send them to what i like to call medical school and teach them the nuances of the domain uh, and then once you do that these models can enter what i like to call the residency phase where they can learn the values of the practice of medicine through safe and constrained interactions with clinicians and users and improve through feedback but improve rapidly and i think eventually with all this we will end up with the north star that i just described uh, before which is a truly trustworthy medical assistant for both our doctors and users that i think will help uh, improve the health of billions worldwide um so with that i will stop uh, and uh, yeah a huge thank you to all my teammates who have been part of these collaborations and a huge thank you to all of you for listening um Yeah, I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much, Vivek. Uh, I think we already have a question from Sarah. Can you please go ahead and ask? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Vivek. Uh, if I recall correctly, MedPalm is sparsely activated. 
Do you think you need all 540 billion parameters to achieve the performance on the USMLE? And I'm also curious to see if any of the test data set was actually present in uh, the training data, because I know a lot of papers use the, the USMLE uh, self-assessment as a benchmark. And, yeah. and people seem to think that those are, aren't actually present outside of like the, self, the UWorld or NBMEs or whatever, but those are actually pretty common on Reddit. So I'm curious to see how you guys ablated and made sure like there was no contamination. Yeah, uh, great question. So I'll answer the second one first. Uh, so we did an analysis and it's coming up in our paper very soon. Uh, there is maybe, I would say, I would like to say like five to 10% of questions which were contaminated or part of the training data. But when we looked at the performance on those questions and performance on questions that were not part of the training data, it was almost completely similar, if not better for the non-contaminated questions. So I don't think we have any reason to doubt that over here. Uh, on the second aspect of 540 billion parameters, um, when we looked at the scaling plots, uh, we actually do see somewhat of an acceleration as you increase the number of parameters as you go from 8 billion to 62 billion to 540 billion in terms of medical reasoning and the ability to answer these USMLE questions. Um, but I also don't think you necessarily need 540 billion to reach the same level of performance as we have right now. I think you can get there with uh, a smaller number, but it may probably not be as small as 8 billion or 10 billion. Um, and then again, I think it depends on what you want to use these models for. It may be possible that you can get a very small model that is constrained to do well on this uh, USMLE kind of task, but it may not be generally useful for other tasks in the medical domain. And so um, the way to think about parameters is it's mostly encoding knowledge, but then as you have like, you know, more parameters stacked up together with increasing depth, I think all this interesting stuff around reasoning emerges uh, from the interactions. And I, I, I think, yeah, you can't necessarily get that with uh, a smaller model. I think reasoning is an emergent property. Uh, thank you. If, if you can answer this last question, how did you uh, make sure, what was the test used to make sure there was no contamination between data sets? Since I know like these data sets are huge usually. Yeah, um, so can take substrings um, from the questions and then you can compute overlap between those substrings that are there in your questions and then uh, in your training data. Um, so, and with that process and You'll, you'll have to break it down into chunks and then aggregate the information in chunks. But I think that's a very reliable indicator of contamination. So. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, I think Christian has a question. Uh, thanks yeah. again for that, for that part of the talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the role of MDs in your in your team. Um, how much do you keep them in the loop? It seems like you are using them for for um, evaluation tasks most mostly, um, some consulting. And I was wondering uh, how do you select your your medical targets that you want to tackle? Oh, um, so I, mean, I think we are really fortunate to have access to a team of world-class clinicians. And so the person I interact with the most is uh, Alan Kathikesadikun, who's very well known, and uh, he's my co-senior lead on all these papers. Um, and uh, yeah, we work together. Uh, Alan brings in the medical perspective. He tells us what problems to tackle, how to frame them, what metrics to use. And then we use that to ground the, the, the modeling process itself. And so it's a collaborative endeavor. You can't do that as AI researchers alone. You can't do that as clinicians alone, even though there are all these no code deep learning tools and whatever. I think you need an interdisciplinary mix. And I feel like in our team at Google Brain and Google Health AI, we have, we are very fortunate to have the best clinicians and AI researchers to uh, tackle many of these problems. Thanks. We have another question from Akash. Hey. Um... Yeah, I had a question around, I guess, some of the risks of like using models like these, like certainly we've seen with just, you know, agnostic of medicine, just large language models have toxicity, misinformation in the medical domain. We've also seen the same thing. Um, I guess, like, have you guys studied this at all? Or like, is there any way that like you can think of that would really mitigate this? Like, I understand like, you know, pre-training on textbooks and stuff, but certainly like medical research 
and the way like clinicians operate statistically has been shown to be like biased and um, oftentimes like result in health disparities and stuff. And I guess like, how do we know that something like this that's trained on text generated by clinicians, whatever, that it's not just propagating or even amplifying underlying like biases and yeah, just improper like medicine. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot to be said and done over here. Um, there, so I think there are key model capabilities that can help alleviate some of these issues where, for example, whenever a model produces a claim, it needs to back that up with proper evidence and grounding and authoritative sources. And so anyone who's relying on the outputs of the model can then go back in and refer to those and see uh, for themselves if, that's, if that claim is true or not. Um, but maybe the other thing I will point out is, um, obviously there is a risk of uh, amplification of biases and everything, but as you scale up the data that you're training these models on, uh, I think those biases also kind of like get um, neutered away a little bit. Uh, I would say that you know it's more possible that you have bias in a smaller data set than in a larger data set. And as you scale up uh, the order of your data set, it's less possible. It's possible that it's actually less biased. Um, and so I think the distribution matters, the scale matters. Um, I'm not saying that they're, they're not. I mean, it's a, like the internet has evolved in a certain way and we're relying on that to like source all our data. And there's obviously biases encoded in there, but I would say that it is arguably much less biased than you know taking constraint settings and data sets and environments. And so in that sense, I believe it is not the worst thing in the world. And I think with these models, for example, we may be able to equip our clinicians and doctors in real time about new information that maybe they did not have access to that might be potentially very important in like scenarios like diagnosing rare diseases or conditions or generalizing to new populations and so on and so forth. So I think if done properly with the right set of capabilities, uh, we will not end up amplifying existing bias versus, but rather just improving um, the, state of, uh, the status quo over here. One last question from me. If, uh, if we, I know we are over time, so, uh, but still, I wanted to ask this question. MedFarm, uh, you mentioned during the fine tuning that you could direct it to sources and make it more sort of retrieval, right? Um, so you could get the answer from, let's say, a reliable source. Do you also have some sort of control in that process? towards directing it to more reliable sources versus less reliable sources? Or do you think there is a trade-off between uh, having the large data set to train a large language model versus having a quality data set? Yeah, I think it's uh, not one or the other. I think they can both be mixed up and you can control um, the, the ratio of like what sources you feed into the model as well, depending on the application setting, um, or even control the output response. And so I think there are all those opportunities. Um, in general, high quality data generally does help, but I would also say that sometimes some of the important data points that we need when dealing with rare, the long tail that we have in medicine, um, that actually comes from lower quality data sources. So it's kind of a trade-off. Like when you have a higher quality data set, I mean, that's like, that may result in us filtering away important information. And so if we really want to like, you know, go towards this holy grail of personalized medicine, then we can't like disregard information just because we think that's low quality because that's where maybe that useful nugget is hidden. Thank you very much. Great. So I think um, this has been amazing, Vivek. Um, thank you so much for presenting everything. And um, thanks to our audience also. Um, great questions and discussion. Um, we will not be posting the YouTube video today, but we will wait until MedFarm 2 is probably released on archive um, before we actually publish this on uh, YouTube. But uh, feel free to reach out to us if you want to put, uh, put us in touch with Vivek or if you have more follow-up questions to ask him or, or anything. Um, yeah, I guess thank, thank you all for joining and we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Much. Great meeting, all of you. Take care. Thank you.